Good afternoon. I'd like to uh, call to order the Health and Human Services and Aging Committee meeting Wednesday, October 6th. And currently it's a little after one. Can we have a, uh, Madam Clerk a roll call, please? As a reminder to all in attendance, this meeting is being recorded and live streamed on the county YouTube page. Card in the row, Ms. Conwell? Present. Mr. Sweeney? Present. Ms. Brown? Here. Mr. Miller? Here. Ms. Stevens? Ms. Stevens is absent at the moment. We have a quorum. All right, I'd like the record reflect that uh, Councilwoman Stevens will not be uh, in attendance today. Um, is there any public comment, Madam Clerk? Yes, we have one person signed in for a public comment. Lou? Welcome, Ms. Lou. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, we thought today is a really fine day. Not too hot, not too cold. Uh, but still, the homeless people in the shelters don't have the same experience. Interestingly, this morning, a bunch of people, really a lot, 20, 30 people, came in with the blueprints, with lots of charts, coming into the building. Well, I guess their intention is to check out the condition of the building and see what they can do about it. So, yes, I got my opportunity to talk to some of them, not all of them together. Uh, this big group, was actually led by Mr. Richard Card. The person asked me, are you an engineer? That one. But today she's very nice and pleasant because she had a big crowd with him. So it's not really a time for him to pick on me or anything. But still, when I mentioned to all these white males, only one token female and a few uh, black gentlemen, so when I address to some of them about uh, we have these functional bathrooms, one of them actually, I'm not sure he was really sincere to question it or he tried to challenge me. He actually said, what do you mean? I said, well, female, we do use bathrooms in a different way than guys. You know, maternal cycles, all those different things. And especially people coming to the shelter nowadays all have health issues. So when you have a facility only putting bathroom in certain places, too so far away from people, where people sleep, guess what, when you suffer from water pills. This is the reason why shelter has been a high risk areas for any kind of a biohazard troubles. It seems like these people still really do not understand. I actually told them frankly and bluntly. I said, if you guys can recommend this place should be demolished, then rebuilt to fit ADA compliances and also to really design that as a human-centered sharing space for female people to stay. That will be better. But I'm not sure if they have the liberties to do that. Unfortunately for me, Look at how they reacted to uh, this whole situation when they go through the buildings. I'm afraid our taxpayers' dollars will go waste again. Please help. Thank you. And also, Mr. Richard Carr actually accepted my suggestion to have a multiple uh, meetings with the people using the facilities to get input. I hope that actually happens. I will keep you updated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is that all for the public comment? Yes, Madam Chair. All right. Um, if someone could make a motion to approve the minutes from the September 22nd meeting. So, so moved. Second, Brown. All right. Moved by Miller, seconded by um, Councilwoman Brown. All in favor, please say aye. 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 We have three uh, matters that were referred to the committee today. Um, Resolution 2021-0225, who will be presenting? I'm reading into the record. Thank you. <laughs> Resolution 2021-0225, authorizing an amendment to agreement number 204, 
with the Metro Health System for comprehensive medical services for families involved with Division of Children and Family Services for the period January 1, 2020 to December 31, 2021 to extend the time period to December 31, 2022 and for additional funds in the amount not to exceed $1,551,000. Thank you. Good afternoon, committee members. Paul Porter, Health and Human Services, on behalf of the Division of Children and Family Services. This is an amendment to our existing agreement for comprehensive medical services with Metro Health Medical Center. We're exercising the final option year that was contained in the RFP for these services, which the contract for that began in January of 2020. We're adding funds in the amount of $1,551,000 divided into an additional $443,000 for 2021 and then $1,108,000 for 2022. The additional funding for this year is broken up as follows between foster care medical uh, and toxicology. So for the toxicology screening services, we're adding $130,000. And then for the foster care medical, we're adding $313,000. The allocation for next year, that $1,108,000, stands the same as the initial allocation for 2021. That's $455,490 for foster care medical. $17,510 for second opinion consultations on medications, and then $635,000 for toxicology screening services. We do continue to see high client counts for these services, and the comprehensive medical services are a 24-7 service availability program, and that includes um, any time a child comes into custody, we work with Metro Health to have them screened within two hours of them needing that service. So it's a high demand service. We have, you know, the screening services for children and then the toxicology services are specific to caregivers involved with DCFS cases. We do require that Medicaid be the payer of first resort for these clients. So Metro Health works to bill any applicable costs to Medicaid before billing it to this contract. Historically, about 55% of the services delivered under this are able to be billed to Medicaid, and then the remaining 45% are what this contract covers the costs of. There are uh, several representatives here for further discussion, both programmatically and then from the vendor. Cindy Weiskettle, the Director of the Division of Children and Family Services is here, as well as Karen Storman and Latoya Hall from DCFS. From Metro Health, we have Brian Rentschler and Anna Velez. Uh, I wanna note that we are planning to do an RFP during calendar year 2022 for these services, and that would be for a new contract to begin in January of 2023 happy to entertain any questions at this point and also happy to call up the representatives from DCFS if you have programmatic questions. And you mentioned a couple of, uh, I have Cindy and Karen, who was, who was the other two individuals that are here? Correct. We have uh, Cindy, Karen, and Latoya from DCFS and then Brian Rentschler and Anna Velez from Metro Health. Brian's last name again? Rentschler, R-E-N-T-S-C-H-L-E-R. Did I get that right, Brian? You got it right. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. You can call them up. Uh, any other questions, I guess, and I'm happy to call up uh, anybody that you'd like to hear from. Um, Madam Chair. Yes, Councilman Miller. I have one question, and it's... Uh, who or what determines what kind of costs are, are paid for through a public program like this and, and what health care uh, services are required to be paid for by, by the families of, of the children or their health care systems? Sure. Um, Councilman Miller, we did include any applicable services as part of this RFP when it was bid out. 
and the contract specifies a specific dollar amount that each individual service can be billed at under the contract. Again, we look at this contract as the payer of last resort. So I guess my answer would be if the child or person is eligible for coverage otherwise, that coverage should be billed first. Otherwise, we would pay for the cost of services. I, I don't believe we're asking for out-of-pocket payments at this point. It's just, you know, using insurance coverage where that exists. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, well, I had a couple of questions. Um, are dental services covered under these contracts? Uh, this does not cover dental services, I don't believe. There's only specific things that are covered under this. The health screenings for children that are coming in, the second opinion consultations for kids that are on psychotropic medications, and then the toxicology screening. Okay, and it, I know it's 100% funded by the state child uh, protection allocation. How does how does that those payments work? They, the state sends us the money and then... Correct. I believe that we pay Metro Health and then we can draw down those state funds for this, 100% in this case. Okay, so if we, if we draw down... Um, you stated, you stated that there was additional funds that was needed, so the state allocated those additional funds? Correct. I believe that we have those funds available for this as well as for other services, and it was just, you know, because the number of referrals that have been sent to Metro are higher than what was initially anticipated in the budget, we had to kind of reallocate those funds to this contract. And again, that amount is 443000 for this year. Okay. Any other questions from Mr. Porter? All right. You can bring up whoever you Perfect. Like. Um, Karen and LaToya, do you want to come up or Cindy? So I don't know if you would have specific programmatic questions for the DCFS staff or if you'd like them to give kind of a little bit of background on the program, you know, from their perspective as the agency sending the referrals to the vendor. Um, they can they can just uh, give give a, a short presentation. I believe this is the contract um, that when it initially was went out, there were other um, proposals? I believe Metro okay. Health was okay. not the only proposing vendor, but they were the highest scored vendor when we initially did this contract for 2020. Okay. So can you talk a little bit about the scoring since it's coming up again next time? I'm going to have to get year. back to you with detailed information about the scoring because I didn't bring that historical info with me. Uh, the original RFP contained option years. So when we entered into the initial agreement, the RFP allowed for us to extend the agreement by amendment based on provider performance and agency priorities as well as available funding. I can get you historical info on the scoring and I can't guarantee that the RFP will look exactly the same when we reissue it because there have been some changes to the template. But again, we will be doing another RFP next year and we anticipate there might be multiple vendors that would apply then as well. Okay, so if you were if the RFP is for next year, that means you're actually working on those on that template now. Correct. Usually, like for something like this, it's a large contract. We would probably look to release something in the spring so that we have plenty of time to get the contract together and before council next fall. Can you keep my office app apprised of the? The changes in the RFP, if there Absolutely. are any. Absolutely, sure. Forward. Thank you. Welcome, ladies. Hi, good afternoon, Hi. members of council. Uh, Karen Storman, Division of Children and Family Services. Good afternoon, Latoya Hall. I'm healthcare coordinator with Division of Children and Family Services. Uh, for this program, the Cuyahoga County Division of Children's Services has been in a partnership with Metro Health since 2013. 
At that time, um, they were they presented this opportunity to partner together to better serve the children who are coming into care in custody of the agency. And as such, we've developed a medical home for foster care in Cuyahoga County. Children who are entering care require a triage per the Ohio Administrative Code, and that requires a physical examination to ensure that they're safely um, placed and healthy. Uh, Metro Health is accessible to our staff 24-7 to provide this service. And then when that service is complete, the post-placement physical is scheduled, which will provide an opportunity for a more comprehensive exam and any psychological or mental health in addition to subspecialty care referrals that perhaps may be presenting at that time. Um, Metro Health is also our provider for all toxicology screens for our caregivers involved with the agency to determine substance use issues and um, positive or negative screen results. Uh, we also, in addition to those two services, are happy to have Metro Health as an expert in providing second opinions for our children on multiple psychotropic medications. So we are better positioned to offer a better practice and ensure that our children are appropriately prescribed medication. And they, Metro Health provides those recommendations to us and their prescribing providers that we can come to some consensus in their ongoing plan of care. So just in terms of volume, um, for 2021, we've had approximately four, just over 1,400 triages, um, 417 post-placement physicals. We've had 19 second opinions and over 10,000 toxicology screens. As of today, we have about 714 children that have a primary care provider with Metro. So in addition to what the foster home, foster care clinic provides, children continue to receive care at Metro. So 714 of our kids remain in Metro system, and we have another 705 children that receive specialty care at Metro as well. So in addition to their medical home services, they are an asset to our families as a whole. So our children often come into care, have had care at Metro, they receive that same care while, while they're in custody, and they can continue with Metro once they are reunified with their families. It provides a real continuity of care for our kids, which is important for children who have experienced trauma. And so that's all I have to say. I, want, I wanted to ask a question about the funding. So the funding, does that just cover the triages of the new kids coming in, or does it also um, cover <clears throat> for the kids that continue in our care to receive additional services if they need? The funding uh, covers the medical home itself. That additional care is either covered by Medicaid, over 90% of our kids qualify for Medicaid, and if we have children that do not, then the agency is responsible for that follow-up. Is there <clears throat> a need for this to be moved quickly? Second reading suspension, or is it fine three readings? Thank you, Councilwoman Conwell. Uh, this amendment is effective upon approval. So since it's not tied to a specific date, we could probably let this go the full three readings. It would be approved at the second meeting in October, correct? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for any of the presenters? All right, thank you all for coming out. Um, I'd like to make a motion for R2021-0225 to mo move to the full council under three readings. Is there a second? Second, second. Brown. Okay, it's been moved by Conwell, seconded by Brown. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could please read the next item into the record. Resolution 2021-0226. Authorizing amendments to contracts with various providers for emergency shelter and rapid rehousing services in connection with fiscal year 2017 Continuum of Care Homeless Assistance Grant program for the period June 1st, 2018 to May 31st, 2021 to extend the time period to May 31st, 2022 
and for additional funds in the total amount not to exceed $992,744. All right. Good afternoon, Paul Porter, Health and Human Services on behalf of the Office of Homeless Services. This is an amendment to four contracts that Office of Homeless Services has had since 2018 for rapid rehousing services in Cuyahoga County. I'm joined by Melissa Sirak, the Director of the Office of Homeless Services, as well as representatives from three of the vendors under this program. From Salvation Army, Bo Hill is here. From Westside Catholic Center, John Litton is here. And then from Journey Center, Sarah Freumason is here. Um, these shelters are all a little unique. They all provide something different across the rapid rehousing spectrum. Family Promise, for instance, is the only shelter in Cuyahoga County focused on youth parenting homes. For Salvation Army, the Zelma George Center is the largest family shelter in the county. Journey Center, formerly known as DVCAC, operates the only confidential domestic violence shelter in the county. And then Westside Catholic Center operates one of four family shelters throughout the county and has an established track record of serving both homeless and low-income families. These are being extended by amendment because HUD decided that rather than doing a new competitive grant application process, due to the pandemic, they would simply continue funding for current grantees. They didn't make that notice to the Office of Homeless Services until the middle of July this year. So you'll notice that these contracts are late at this point, but that was because we couldn't move forward with these until we knew how the federal government was going to disperse the funding. These are all split between HHS levy funding and this continuum grant funding, which goes back to uh, 2017, fiscal year 2017 initially. We do anticipate that next year there will be a competitive process for these funds. So new contracts would likely be awarded through the same review and ranking process where the you know highest scored or highest reviewed programs are the ones that'll get funding. I will note that based on that timeline, we were able to get these contracts drafted, reviewed, and then submitted within two months from the notice that we received from HUD, which was about as quick as we'd be able to get something in under normal circumstances, considering the dollar amount of these agreements. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions from a contractual perspective. And then I would turn to Melissa and the vendor representatives if you have questions about the services. <clears throat> yes, Paul. All right, um, I, I know Journeys has housing. Are all of these connected with some sort of housing? Uh, so the Rapid Rehousing Councilwoman Conwell is designed to get individuals into housing as quickly as possible. So these are shelter services, uh, particularly devoted to um, serving families um, that are able to place those families quickly somewhere so they're not on the streets. I, Melissa, did I explain that? Well, come on up. <laughs> and then, Paul, uh, if you could go over, um, you could send it if, if, if it's uh, long, but how much each of the... Oh, I think I see him. I see, I see the dollar amounts now. Okay. okay, I didn't see him before. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome. Melissa Serac, Director of the Office of Homeless Services. Just wanting to provide you a little bit more of an overview um, of the providers that we have with us today. Um, together, these organizations provide shelter to women, families, and victims fleeing domestic violence. In addition, case management services are offered, including linkages to housing, employment, and legal services, mental health treatment, and counseling related to trauma and specific to domestic violence survivors and children who witness violence. The primary goals of these projects are to first provide safe, supportive, and respectful shelter for all residents, link families with permanent housing as quickly as possible, assist clients in access to income and housing, and link families with ongoing community supports to assure housing stability. 
It is important to note that our homeless continuum of care is based on the housing first philosophy, which states that any individual or family is ready for housing if provided the appropriate supports. These programs adhere to this model and begin worth working with individuals and families on housing plans immediately upon entry into shelter. The comprehensive case management services that are offered further support stability, ensuring that homelessness is brief, rare, and non-reoccurring. I would also like to acknowledge the success of these providers in continuing to serve our community during the pandemic with no interruption of service. Although there have been operational and administrative challenges, together in 2020, they've served 984 individuals, including 341 adults and 643 children, providing over 76,000 nights of shelter. With me today, as Mr. Porter mentioned, our colleagues, and I'd like to ask them to join me to answer any additional questions you have or any program updates you'd like to hear. Okay. Any questions from Councilman Miller? Yes. Uh, my question is whether these programs are an alternative to the county shelter services, or or are these programs where people would particularly go initially go to the county shelter, and then one of these programs would be an intermediate step along along the process, to which then they would later go to permanent housing. <laughs> well, <I'll be> <laughs> to the chair, councilman, uh, the. Uh, for Your us at the Salvation record. Army, it is... Your name for the record. Oh, I'm, I apologize. My name is Bo Hill. I'm with the Salvation Army. And um, through the chair, Councilman Miller, um, for us, it is services that are provided to the individuals while they're in shelter. And so it allows us to do... The, it allows us to pay for the staff that allows that rapid rehousing and the coordination of those services to occur between between the providers. So hopefully that answers your question, sir. Uh, partially at best. Uh, what I'm trying to Councilman get Miller, an may understanding I add of is, is would someone come right in off the streets and go into one of these programs, or would they likely go to the county shelter first, stay there for a while, and then go to one of these programs? Individuals do, or families do, oftentimes show up at shelter. However, they're redirected to coordinated entry, which serves as our single access point to all shelters, whether you're single adult or family. From their coordinated entry, um, does an assessment and then makes the appropriate referral based on the individual circumstances and the appropriate shelter. And I don't know if you want to speak a little bit more to Journey Center as well. They're a little unique. Hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Framson, Senior Director of Crisis Housing and Shelter at Journey Center. Um, because we do serve um, domestic violence survivors who are actively fleeing, we process our own intakes through um, our own confidential line. Um, so recognizing that there are safety concerns about accessing some of the county shelters with perpetrators who may be accessing those shelters as well. So our process involves um, a call directly from a survivor to our help helpline. Um, and at that point, we do process a pretty thorough assessment, focusing really on escape planning, safety planning, and helping them get to our services as safely as possible. At that point, we then leverage all of our resources to assist them through the legal process as needed, as well as through the housing support um, and placing them in um, through the rapid rehousing program in housing. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I would also ask, what's the typical length of stay at these programs? Um, at Journey Center, we really recognize that each survivor has their own path, and it may take a different amount of time for each person. We look at an average length of stay of about 45 days. It's traditional for us. John Litton, Westside Catholic Center, Executive Director, um, and I would say similar, 30 to 45 days of stay. And to put a finer point on, on a, the answer to your question, Councilman Miller, um, our shelters are the county, part of the county's answer to family homelessness. Um, and there really isn't a stop off somewhere else other than that coordinated intake that then directs them to one of our sites. Thank you. 
In terms of, uh, from Melissa, are you done, Councilman Miller? Um, did the, we talked about a coordinated intake, and I, I know you mentioned families and, and single adults. Uh, does that include the youth that are 18? Yes. Are they participating? Young adults in do that? go through coordinated so intake. We'll, We'll keep that even though we're progressing uh, for. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and one question for Sarah. Um, 45 beds. 45 beds with the, um, because of the pandemic, we did have to uh, decrease our bed size. Um, right now we're serving about 30 to 35 in shelter and we are continuing to contract with a uh, confidential hotel to continue to serve the, those same amount of folks. Okay, uh, that's only time. because of, due to COVID. Due to correct? COVID, yeah, and our infrastructure. Okay, um, in terms of the shelter, it only is for females, correct? No, we do serve men and women. Um, we serve anybody who identifies as domestic violence survivors, and that's self-identified. Councilman Sweeney. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Just put in perspective for me, uh, demand. Excuse me, Mr. Sweeney, he's speaking to the microphone, please. Sorry about that, coworker. I'll try to behave. Just the demand, is it a waiting list of 2,000, or is it just waiting for folks so I can just get my hand, Absolutely. my head wrapped around this a little bit so I can continue to serve here? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, you know, prior to COVID, prior to the pandemic, we always had a, a large demand for our services as we are the only confidential shelter. Traditionally, we were turning away about 100 to 150 families a year. Um, with the onset of the pandemic since the initial shutdown, uh, we unfortunately had to turn away about 320 families. Um, as many of you have, are familiar, there has been an increase in domestic violence and severity. Um, and with the county having you know, the one shelter, it does make it challenging to serve all those folks. We have adapted some of our programming though to try to meet them out in the community, try to connect them to resources, but housing still remains a concern. Thank you. Similar for the other two entities through the chair. Um, uh, through the chair, Councilman Sweeney, the, I know that for us, we have a 35 room family shelter and we serve on any given night somewhere between 110 and 125 people. As far as the backlog, I do not know that that'd probably be someone from coordinated intake or um, Melissa would probably have that, but I knew, do know that for us, we are full every night. And the, with the pandemic, the biggest impact for us is our length of stay was extended during the pandemic just because of the challenges of getting people into housing. Thank you. Councilman? Councilman? Uh, I, would, I would only add that uh, the kink in this has really been getting people into permanent housing, finding units, finding places for people to go. Um, we are generally full um, most nights as well, but uh, I wouldn't say we're turning people so away, so away so much as uh, you know, coordinated intake is constantly um, ensuring that every place is as full as it can be before they uh, figure out other options for, for a family. And thank you, Madam Chairman. Just gives me a big respect of how important uh, you can only deal with what you have and Result of more permanent housing is just incredibly important. So, thank you, Councilman Sweeney. If I may add, please. Um, um, we we did see um, less families in 2020 during the pandemic, which of course um, helped the need that uh, there often exists. However, um, we manage overflow shelter as well, and typically at times uh, there are where there are spots that are. Um, not available. However, we work with our partners that are HUD funded and not HUD funded throughout our continuum to make additional space. Several of these providers also have emergency rooms that aren't technically um, a shelter referral, for lack of better words. So we really work together when we are in times of crisis. And we were also creative during COVID utilizing shelters as well for those families um, and individuals on a confidential level. Thank you for the uh, full explanation. And to my colleagues, thank you for your patience with me while I Direct, Director Sirak, uh, where is the overflow shelter? Uh, where do where do we where do we utilize now? It's currently at Haven Home. Haven. All right. Any other questions for any of the presenters? All right. Hearing none. Thank you all for thank coming you. out today. Um, Paul, if I could ask if you need this second reading suspension. 
Thank you, Councilwoman Conwell. Thank you. Based on the lateness, sorry, uh, with the grant notification from HUD, yes, if we could have this approved with second reading suspension, that'd be great. These vendors have continued to deliver services even after the uh, prior funding expired. So we wanna be able to get this in place to issue payments for services since July 1 uh, as soon as possible. All right, you stated something earlier in regards to that this would probably go out for our new RFP next year. Sure, and, yeah, this process is a little bit different in that because it's on the continuum of care, sometimes there are partners from like the city of Cleveland, for instance, which also receives HUD funding for homeless services. So for those federal funds, there's a review and ranking process that these vendors go through. And then we usually award our local funding using those same metrics. So we don't do a separate RFP for these. It'll still be through that same review and ranking. It's a similar type process where the proposals are scored and the highest scoring ones are the ones that receive funding. I just wanna be clear that it's not a formal RFP using a county's lingo. We follow kind of a federal process with it. Okay, so I, my concern would be um, when you do a new RFP, there's uh, new possible people that will bid on the contract, correct? Correct, that's always a possibility. And I, Melissa might be able to answer this better. I'm sure there were more proposals last time than what we had funding for, correct? Each, each year, Madam Chair, um, as, as Paul mentioned, there is the review and ranking process, which is pretty in, intensive through the continuum. And at, at that point, there's opportunity for individuals that have previously received funding. We look at um, outcomes, standards, and benchmarks. And then in addition to that, HUD has a different um, pot of money, for lack of a better word, also for new projects. So at that time, this is all prioritized by the continuum of care, and those new projects are then considered, and the group together strategizes and puts together the overall ranking, which then is submitted to HUD as, as the competition process. I was just looking at domestic violence. We, we know we only have one shelter for that. So. Correct, yeah, we, we pretty much follow HUD's prescribed process. All right. Thank you very much. So I'd like to um, have someone make a motion for R2021-0226 to go to the full council under second reading suspension. So moved. Second, Brown. Okay, moved by Miller, seconded by Brown. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Aye. Madam Clerk, if you could read the uh, last item into the record, please. Resolution 2021-0227, making an award on requisition number 5966 with Stella Mars, Inc. and the amount not to exceed $530,000 for temporary housing for homeless single adult males in Cuyahoga County with substance abuse issues for the period 7-1, 2021 to June 30, 2023. Good afternoon, Paul Porter, Health and Human Services, on behalf again of the Office of Homeless Services. This is an award to Stella Maris on an RFP that closed at the end of May this year. We worked with the vendor to develop the contract and the scope of the work over the following months. This is 100% levy funded and it's a contract that supports shelter services for homeless men with substance abuse issues. It's a two-year contract worth $265,000 per year for a total two-year value of $530,000. The contract provides basic temporary housing with access to intensive outpatient treatment for 20 homeless men at a time. We also have a goal to link clients with permanent housing and sustainable income, and then to link clients with recovery supports in the community. Um, there were a couple of issues with uh, the language in the contract. The initial contract draft was written for two years, but it had a $265,000 value as the total value rather than the one-year value. That was caught when it was going through the final review uh, for submission to council. So we had to get the contract corrected and the vendor had to approve the new copy, it wasn't really a change in scope or anything, 
basically just a typographical error in the contract value. But that delayed us because it kind of was pulled out of the uh, review and approval process, corrected, and then resubmitted. So again, we do recognize that this one is further behind as well and would ask for approval of second reading suspension for this too. Uh, Melissa Serak from the Office of Homeless Services is here. And then uh, Jason from Selamaris is here as well. All right, any questions for Paul? Councilman Sweeney. More of a curiosity. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. You said it was for 20 beds? Correct. And I Stella Mars has more than 20 beds? I can, I would defer to the vendor and to Melissa uh, for a specific answer on that. I just know that that's what this particular contract funds. So um, Jason and your last name is Dobner? Correct. Okay, perfect. So Jason Dobner from Stella Mars is here and can help to answer that question. Thank you. Hi, yeah, Jason. Hi, I'm Jason Dobner uh, with Stella Maris. I'm the supportive housing Excuse manager. me, can you speak into the microphone, please? Should I repeat myself? Yes. Okay, hi, my name's Jason Dobner. I'm with Stella Maris. I'm the supportive housing manager. We have 46 beds for men. Yeah, and that's my question, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, we have a specific 20 bed uh, funding for substance abuse for, I believe, males. Correct. Uh, and then there's 23 other, 26 other ones. I mean, is this an opportunity where funds could be co-mingled and stuff like that, or just they plop it into your general operating and you do whatever you want with them? So those other beds are, we work with the VA too, that also has to go through Homeless Services Clarity that we report on as well. We have eight beds for them. Um, and then the other beds are courts. We work with the uh, drug courts downtown, um, as well as some other drug courts and self-pay as well. Got it. So I'm just trying to figure, so our 20 beds are funded by these dollars and they're specifically from referrals from Cuyahoga County? Correct. And if you have 29, but you have three beds that are available through the drug court because they're not being used, can you move those over? Is it a hard 20? No, it's a hard, no, we do. And that's another thing too. Um, we go down to the shelter um, and do pre-screenings with them, with the homeless clients down there that want to, we do a group down there. Um, we were actually going to Maple Heights too at the hotel during COVID and all of that stuff. So they were uh, referring people to go over to the hotels as well. So we'd go down there and screen them. Um, we don't force them to come in. We're an abstinence-based program. So if that meets their needs, um, basically when you come in, you can come in with nothing off the street, off the shelter, zero income, zero medical, mental health services, any of that. We provide them with everything from day one. Beautiful. Uh, and I'm through the chair to Stella Maris is just a rock of the community forever. And it's always waiting on a bed, waiting on a bed. Correct. Right but now, if, and we are very creative at times. Um, no, to, absolutely. You get, yeah, I mean, to help out the got community. A week. Okay, the homeless we, got, we snuck in here, but behave and then continue on and try to, you know, get back on the it, right path. In a sense. Yes. Yeah. So that's just for me. Under, we're voting on specific dollars for beds, and I wanted to know the inner workings instead of having the perspective of what a wonderful institution it is from uh, just living in this neighborhood <coughs> for my whole life. Thank you. So thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Are you, um, Jason, are you a referral uh, resource for uh, the Diversion Center? Clinical Director, we are a referral. Excuse me, can you speak into the microphone, please? Sorry. Christine Robinson, Clinical Director at Stella Maris. We are a referral uh, for the Diversion Center. We we haven't received many, if any, actually at, at this point, but we are definitely a referral and eager to take folks. Okay. Would that uh, <clears throat> would that be inclusive of our 20 bid that we pay for? Would, is that how they would be funneled through, or would it be different funding stream? It, it would depend, I guess, if they were homeless um, and, you know, met that criteria. It certainly, the individual could go into one of the funded beds. Um, we would also look at the other details of the individual's life. And, for instance, if they were a veteran, they may qualify for one of the veteran beds um, or, you know, depending on, on their other circumstances as well. So we would take a look at that and in place in the most appropriate way. Yeah, I'm just, everyone wants to get paid, so 
usually you want to see, I want to see how that's going to flow and, you know, when individuals are picked up from the diversion center, how they're referred out and how that money, is it coming from us or? Sure. And again, it would depend on the circumstances for the individual. All right. Is there anything, any other questions from anyone? You guys want to share anything additional in regards to? <laughs> Melissa Sarek, again, Director of Office Homeless Services. I just wanted to quickly add to your point, Councilman Sweeney, about the criticalness of their services, to speak to the quality of their service during the pandemic, which again, I'm grateful for you guys continuing to provide your service. In 2020, the program served 144 unduplicated individuals with a 94% of the participants exiting the program to a permanent destination, mm. which means permanent housing. Um, this outcome far exceeds the HUD standard for obtaining permanent housing. So I just wanted to acknowledge that because as you know, the ultimate goal of our continuum is to move someone from unhoused to housed as quickly as possible. And this program does so. So thank you. And to the chair, thank you for the ex extra explanation because from my perspective till today, Stella Myers was uh, taking care of folks that had a uh, substance abuse issue or problem. And you guys do a wonderful job just with that. but. Getting the next step of going to permanent housing just gives them much more better opportunity to be successful. Yeah, and I would, um, so Jason Dobner, Stella Maris. Um, I was going to add too, Melissa kind of stole my thunder. Um, but if you wanted some numbers as well, um, I have that too. Um, I mean, the majority of our clients too, and these, these numbers are skewed because we still have 20 in these beds right now. Um, but just for example, I ran a quick report for, what was it, 831 to 831.21 one from 20 per year. From 831.2020 to 831.2021. Um, in that one, we served 94 clients. You got to understand, too, it's still a little skewed because we the report's not going to count the ones that are still in there. for. But um, we had, so 74 exits. I mean... Gosh, the majority of them all had jobs. Um, what was it like? I have it in here somewhere. Um, I think it was 80% of our clients that at discharge had jobs or they were in the mix going to jobs. So we didn't count them as having a job because when they were physically there, they didn't have the job. They said they were going to a job. So in good conscience, I couldn't just state when they left at exit that they had a job even though you know, one was allegedly lined up for him. Um, out of that, 74, just two as well. Can you scoot over to the microphone a little, please? Sorry, I'm not good at this, <laughs> and I'm sweating. Um, <laughs> the um, yeah, yeah. the um, demographics, we serve 58 Caucasian males, 34 black African-American males, and then two uh, multiple races, such as like Hispanic or Latino which was kind of interesting to me because it's just so low with uh, Latinos, which is, wasn't traditionally how it was. I've been there for, for quite a while, over 10 years. And um, yeah, it's just weird. I don't know, just something when I was looking at this that um, we haven't served that many Hispanic, but it's pretty even keel when it comes to demographics as opposed to um, Hispanic males. Jason, is this program similar to the open door? Okay. Um, in a sense, yes. Um, but I, we offer, a, I don't want to say we offer, because we refer to the open door as well, if need be. Um, but we have everything there from, from mental health to um, a quick stop for, for psychiatry if there's an issue with you know, someone comes in, they've been homeless all, this whole time. They're not compliant with their medications. They don't have their medications. So we're, we have a psychiatrist on staff that actually helps us get them hooked up immediately because it can be tricky when you're trying to get a client in to see a psychiatrist immediately. It doesn't happen immediately. You have to set up an appointment so he's able to get, you know, meet their needs and stuff um, for that aspect, mental health as well. Um, we have case managers, counselors, therapists, individuals. We've, we've got an army of, of people to help these clients. And I think that's why the, the numbers reflect or the, um, the positive outcomes reflect is because of the staff 
not only that we have an army, but all the staff seems to really wholeheartedly care about the individual. So you it's not a, just a job. So you have a psychiatrist on staff? Correct. Volunteer or they pay? They're, they're paid. So um, we have... Um, Mickey, you speak into the microphone. Sorry about that. <laughs> They're paid. We do have a couple of different contracts um, with psychiatrists that are able to meet the needs of our our full continuum of care. So the, the doc that works with detox may not be exactly the same doc that works with outpatient, um, but they are paid. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. And to piggyback on that too, he wouldn't be primary. He's just kind of to a stopgap until we get them set up with their primary so they can get on their medication. Thank you. Anything further? All right, hearing or seeing none, um, I'd like to open, uh, uh, Paul, do you need the second reading suspension? Thank you, Councilwoman Conwell. Yes, if we could get this approved with second reading suspension because it goes back to that July 1 start date, that would be best. Thank you. All right, and I thank the guests for coming out today. And thank Director uh, Sirak for all the work she does. Um, if we could open up, uh, someone could place a motion for R2021-0227. So moved. Second. All right, moved and seconded. Uh, all, uh, for second reading suspension, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Paul, do we, you know if we have anything coming up? Uh, any contracts coming this, to this committee anytime soon? So probably the biggest contracts that are going to be coming to you before the end of the year, Councilman Conwell, are going to be uh, some of our larger master agreements. For DCFS, that would include out-of-home care and family-centered supportive services. For DSAS, that would include the Community Social Services Program. We're still working with the vendors to get all those master agreements finished. So I do anticipate those will come before you during November, not any time during the rest of the month of October. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any miscellaneous business from many of my colleagues? All right. Seeing or hearing none, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>